Greetings, this is Bishop Reed here with another episode of Arrows of Revival. Uh, Dave Chappelle just got cancelled for stating a fact, and we're going to go into how us as Christians can respond to transgender ideology. Ready, aim, shoot. Welcome to Arrows of Revival. God wants to use you as an arrow in his revival. And he's releasing arrows across the world for a world revival. Tune in as we discuss these arrows. Praise God. Good greetings to you all another time. Uh, thank God for each and every one of you that joined us today on Arrows of Revival. And uh, today, right in the news, uh, trending in the news right now is a, a very, uh, in some way, in some ways, a funny uh, story that is going on right now. So let's go ahead and get right into our trending news. So Dave Chappelle. Uh, the well-known comedian was canceled for stating a fact that for most of you listening to me is an accepted fact, uh, but he was canceled for this. So this is what he said. This is what J Dave Chappelle said. He said, gender is a fact. Every human being in this room, every human being on earth had to pass through the legs of a woman to be on earth. That is a fact and he said this on on a, on a netflix special that he performs on and because of this statement he was uh canceled by many in the news media for state stating a biological fact and stating a, a fact of our sexual identities and this is the the condition of the world that we're living in right now where reality is denied uh, and people are ostracized the people are spoken against people are canceled so to speak for speaking something that is been factual for thousands of years and have been accepted by human beings for thousands of years is being rejected but what we're going to get into more today is how do we respond to the transgender ideology as christians what does the bible say about it and and if you, you may be a young person, um, you may, may be a Christian brother or sister, you're facing this ideology maybe in academia, maybe in a college, maybe in a schoolroom, maybe among uh, peers, maybe from other Christians who have accepted the transgender ideology because uh, there are so-called Christians who have embraced that. Um, and you want to know how to respond to that how to respond to such a thing. And also, this information is also good for your own stability so that you don't start to give in to that ideology, which uh, many are even using the Bible to, to back up these claims. Uh, so how can we respond to this from a biblical point of view? But the reason why Dave Chappelle's uh, joke, so to speak, the reason why he could use it and it's funny is because it's a funny thing to deny reality. You know, if you, if you see a person uh, denying something that's actually true, and uh, it's, 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 it's weird, it's, it's a funny thing. It's a, people laugh at stuff like that. So when he makes a statement, gender is a fact, every human being, every human born in this room had to come through the legs of a woman, people laugh. Because it's, it's in, in the popular media, it's no longer spoken as truth. But when he says it in such plain language, People laugh at the fact because most people really know that this is true. So that's what trending the news right now. And before we get into the, the Christian response to the transgender ideology, let's go into our daily confessions. Praise God. Praise God. So for our daily confessions today, I'm going to go into Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. And Jeremiah 1 verse 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, 
And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And this scripture shows us that God has formed us. God has formed us from the womb, and God had a purpose for our lives, even from the womb. Now, those of you who have committed your life to Jesus Christ, because you have made that commitment to Christ, glory to God, you can discover the purpose that God had for you from the womb. And what is astounding about this scripture is, number one, is that it shows us that that God is a part of our formation, that God put the process of creation in place for us to be formed, fashioned in the womb of our mothers. And then, and then secondly, glory to God, he gave us a purpose or he had a purpose in mind for us, even from our, our even from the time of our conception before thou came as for out of the womb, I sanctified it, meaning I set you apart. I ordained thee, I consecrated you, or ordained you to be a prophet unto the nation. Now, this was Jeremiah, and Jeremiah's call was to be a prophet, but your calling may be in different arenas, in different areas. You're, you may have your call from the Lord. You may have your call from God. Uh, and we got to embrace the scripture because this scripture tells us who we are in Christ. It tells us what our purpose is, what our call is. It lets us know that even from birth, we are who we are in Jesus Christ. So here it is, the scripture. Speak it along with me. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest for out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now your call may not specifically be a prophet, but you all have a call from the Lord. And we are all called to declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things you can do is you could change around the words thee and you could say me. So before, before... And, and you could change I to God. So I could state like this, Jeremiah 1.5, Before God formed me in the belly, God knew me. And before I came forth out of him, glory be to God. So I'm going to say that one more time. Before God formed me in the belly, God knew me. And before I came forth out of the womb, God sanctified me and God ordained me a prophet unto the nation. Say it again. Before God formed me in the belly, God knew me. And before I came out of the womb, God sanctified me and God ordained me a prophet unto the nation. Let that get into your spirit. Praise God. Who you are was formed by God. What your purpose is was, was, was set by God. But the plan for your life, God had it in mind from the moment you were in the womb. Embrace that. Believe that. Know that you have a call from the Lord. There's a purpose that God has for your life. You're not on this earth for no reason at all. You're not on this earth just to make some cash and take care of family. No, God has a purpose for your life. He, he, from the womb, he set you apart and had a plan for you. Before God formed me in the belly, God knew me. Before I came forth out of the womb, God sanctified me. And he ordained me a prophet unto the nations. Can you try it again? Can you say it with me? Before God formed me in the belly, God knew me. And before I came forth out of the womb, God sanctified me. And he ordained me a prophet unto the nations. Speak that scripture to yourself. Hold on to the fact that you have a divine purpose from the Lord, even from conception. And hold on to the fact that God formed you for the purpose on which he placed you on the earth for. Praise God. God bless you and see you uh, again on another time with our daily confessions. Here is what we're going to do right now. Right now, we're going to go into our Biblical Insights. Praise God. So how do we respond to transgender ideology? How do we respond to transgender ideology? And I'm going to do, I'm going to do this is what we're going to do. I'm going to present to you three ideas that come from the transgender community. Uh, including those who claim to be Christians. Uh, I'm going to let you know some of the things that they state and they say, 
and then how we could respond to it biblically. So the first one, the first lie, the first transgender ideology lie is this. Gender is different from sex. Some people don't feel like they fit in the category of man or woman. The second one is this. The second transgender lie. When the Bible says male and female, it was not meant to be binary, but meant to be on a spectrum. That's the second one. And the third one, is God, is, there's the third lie. There are no verses in the Bible that is against trans identity. So let's deal with these three things from a biblical view, just so you know if uh, someone is trying to convince you to embrace this ideology, you know you're equipped how to respond to it, what the Bible says about it. Uh, so let's go into it. So first of all, let me say this to you. The Bible is a complete book, and it's to understand the Bible. You have to understand the spirit of the Bible. You have to understand the message of the Holy Spirit throughout the scriptures. So scripture tends to build on each other. It, it, it has a certain worldview, has a certain perception that it all goes by. So what tends to happen is that because the Bible has a particular view, for example, in the Bible, the existence of God is a given. So when the Bible talks about God, that's a given. Similarly, when the Bible talk about the different sexes, male and female, it talks about it as a given. And it deals with it as if the differences between the sexes are a given thing. That's not in doubt in the Bible. The Bible speaks on a whole in that way. And understanding that context will help us to understand what the Bible says about this particular thing. Because like I said, there are those um, in the transgender community uh, that claim to be Christians and are using the Bible to uh, back up what they believe and their, and their practice. However, the problem is you could pick a scripture there and try to explain it away, but you're explain, they're explaining it within a different context, within the context of a society today. But the Bible is not going from the worldview of today. The Bible has a specific worldview that's rooted in uh, the knowledge of God and, and rooted in the principles of scriptures. So let's get into this. How do we respond to this first lie, this first transgender ideology lie? This is that, that, and this is it. That gender is different from sex. Some people don't feel like they fit into the category of man or woman. So the idea here is because some people don't feel like they fit neatly into the biological sex of male or female, man or woman. Gender is a different thing where gender is something that is... Uh, an inner feeling or an innate understanding or inner knowledge of who they are in terms of uh, their gender, whether they're male or female. So how do you respond, respond to that? Well, first, I'll say this. Our sex is a reality that does not depend on feelings. Whether you're male or female, the reality of that doesn't depend on our inner feeling doesn't depend on what we may think we are inside. It doesn't depend on an innate inside knowledge, but it's a reality that is absolute and objective on its own. So gender in this meaning of being an inner feeling of one's identity is not based on biblical truth or just the truth of nature. And the reason why we know this is so because of what many forget, in the Bible, it is a given. One of the biblical views of the Bible is that humankind is corrupt. So the things that comes from our inside, what our heart thinks, actually often is wrong and deceitful. In fact, the Bible says in Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? My heart is talking about that the inner part of a person, you know, their thoughts, their feelings, uh, they, what they think within, that inner man, the heart 
or the effort here is that inner man, that inner feeling. And here the scripture is telling us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It is possible for a person to deceive themselves by the thoughts of their own heart. So be careful. Uh, we have to be careful here. And one of the responses to give to this transgender ideology is that when they say, well, inside, I know that I'm a man, even though it's a woman, or inside, I know that I'm a woman, let them know, well, your heart can deceive you. Just because you think or you feel like you're something inside doesn't mean it's actually true. Because humankind, because of sin, because of the fall, we are corrupt and our heart can deceive. The heart is deceitful and very wicked. We cannot fully fathom or take a hold of the depths of the deceitful motives of the heart. So an inner feeling may not reflect truth or reality, but rather is being driven by an ungodly desire or, or by an ungodly motive. Not only that, but the Bible teaches Jesus himself taught that evil springs from within, from inside a man. So if you're getting feelings and thought that, well, I'm not actually a man, I'm a, you know, for a biological man, I'm not actually a man, I'm a woman, or you're a biological woman uh, 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 by sex, and you go, well, I don't feel like I'm actually a woman, I'm, I'm really a man. Do you know that evil thoughts come from within? Yeah, the Bible says in Mark chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus is speaking, and he said, from, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. Verse 22 of Mark 7, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. In other words, those inner feelings that you have, that you think is telling you what your gender is, it could be an evil thing coming from within you and defiling who you really are. And that was the words of Jesus. The hearts of men have been darkened and are on the imagination of men and thoughts are producing evil because of that darkness. Yes, the Bible teaches that, that the hearts of men have been darkened through sin. It teaches that in Romans chapter 1. Glory to God. You see, our sexual identities are actually given by God. God declared male and female. Genesis 1.27. It's the scripture that says, male and female created he them. From the Bible, God is already declaring what he had set up. See, the identity of male and female didn't come from a human being in a feeling. It came from God establishing that in creation. So our sex come from above. We understand our sex from what was already given, not what we create from within. <clears throat> Changing the nature of that reality and that truth is a common thing that sinful man whose heart have been darkened usually do. When the heart of man is darkened, they change things that are truth. They're changing that our reality. And here's the scripture, Romans 1, 21. He said, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. So what happened here? The scripture in Romans 1, 21 is telling us that when mankind knew God, they didn't accept him and glorify him as the God he is. They changed that reality because they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. You see, when we take something that is clear because the visible things, nature shows who God is. So we know there's a creator by his creation. And when we take something that's clearly there and don't accept it as such is because of foolish and then godly thoughts and imaginations that are within us because because our hearts have been corrupted and because our hearts have been darkened through sin so the changing of the reality of nature and the truth of it is because glory to god of a darkened heart now what the bible actually says about how we should treat our bodies this is a this is an important thing because should we be accepting 
our sex based on the biological parts of our body? That's a question right here. That's a key question. Well, the Bible tells us. Let's see what the, what the Bible's perspective is on this. It says in Psalm 139, verse 11, David is speaking in Psalm 139, 11, and he says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul know it well. So here you see that David is honoring God, praising God for how he was made. Now, here he's talking about his body. Let's go a little further. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, we are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God doesn't deny the physical aspects that we have. He doesn't deny our body. He said to glorify God in your body. God is the one who formed your natural body. Don't deny God's formation. He says in Jeremiah 1 verse 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Key word there, form. What does it mean to form? You, you think of, uh, you think of a, a, a potter that is creating a vase or creating a pot, that he has to form it into different shapes. In the same way, God had the creative processes to form us in a particular kind of way. Um, Psalm 139, verse 15, David said this. He said, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. God formed us himself. He fashioned us, glory to God, through the creation processes that he put in place. So there was a formation that took place. At creation, the Bible said in Genesis 2, verse 7, that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. There was a formation. And David said, uh, we were fearfully and wonderfully made. That means the physical features of a man's body were formed by God. Genesis 2 verse 7, God formed Adam out of the, the dust of the earth. And when he made woman, he formed the woman using a rib from the man. So that, that formation, David said, we're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And you know, I'll make this point. It is clear in the Bible that our physical bodies are part of our identity. How do I say that? Well, for God to come and die on the cross, for Jesus to die on the cross, he had to become a man. He, 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 the incarnation is all about uh, Christ coming down in the form of, of a man, form, because there was a certain formation. In the form of a man, so Jesus was a man in every aspect. The fact that Christ could not be identified as a man without coming in the same form shows us that the body is a part of our identity. We identify that Christ is fully a man. How do we do that? Because he came in the form of a man. So formation that's an important aspect. Where our physical bodies is part of our identity. Praise God. Now, let's get into the second transgender lie. So, again, for the first transgender, transgender lie, that, that your gender is what you feel inside. The lie about gender in that sense is, is that the hearts of man produces evil things. As I said, according to Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. According to Mark 7, 21, 23, evil things come from the heart. So your heart telling you that, you know, you're a woman when you're actually a man, that could be just an evil thing, a corrupt thing coming from your heart. And then secondly, we ought to glorify God in our bodies because our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God formed our body. So that's the first point there. Here is a second transgender lie. Second transgender lie is this, and this comes from those who say they're Christians, they're actually using the Bible, and they say when the Bible says male and female, it was not meant to be binary, but meant to be a on a spectrum. And uh, <laughs> this is cunningly done. They actually say something like when God said heaven and earth, there 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 are actually things that connect the heaven and earth. And 
what they're trying to say is when the Bible uses the word and is not meant to be binary, but it's meant to be inclusive, meaning it's going from one part end of the spectrum to another. So there are things between heaven and earth. And they use that argument to say when God said male and female, he didn't mean binary as if male, female, but a spectrum of creation. That is what they say. However, here's why this is a lie. It's the lie because the Bible continuously shows differences between men and women, male and female, that emphasizes the fact that it is a binary. The idea of a spectrum of male and female does not exist in biblical phraseology. There's no phrases in the Bible. There is no conception in the Bible where there is a spectrum between male and female or a spectrum of genders or, or sexes. There is clearly a, a binary uh, relationship that is meant. And just to give you some examples, just some examples around the Bible, the woman is identified as a weaker vessel, First Peter 3, verse 7. It says, husband, um, give honor to your wife as the weaker vessel. Again, it's identifying two separate sexes. The creation story emphasizes the difference in the, emphasizes the binary between man and woman. Adam was first created in, in Genesis 2, verse 7. It said, God formed the man out of the dust of the earth. And then Adam was put to sleep and the woman was created. A rib was taken from Adam and a woman was created. Now, since biologically, women have certain features, men have certain features, was accepted by most uh, scientific communities, then it's clear that when God made Adam, there were certain features that Adam had. And then when Adam was put to sleep and the woman was created, Adam said, this is now flesh of my flesh and bone, my bone shall be called woman. In other words, Adam was saying, she's of the same nature as I am, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones, but there is something different. She shall be called woman. There's something complementary about uh, that woman, about that relationship, woman, from the womb of the man. And, and so the woman was created with another set of features. So here's what the Bible also tells us. The Bible says, Genesis 2, 21, 23, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh uh, instead thereof. Verse 22 of Genesis 2, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. Here, you see, the, it's clearly a binary relationship here. Man, woman. And verse 23 of Genesis 2, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. He stated her identity because she was taken out of man. So, yes, a man and woman, there's a complementary relationship where they come together to become one. However, there was a difference in the formation of the bodies that identified the woman as a woman, the man as a man. The man was not created in the same way the woman was created. The woman wasn't created in the same fashion. So there's differences in what their bodies carry. So you know if you're a man or a woman by those differences. The Bible also emphasizes natural differences in functions. What do I mean by that? Well, here, here's a curious scripture in the Bible. Romans 1, 26 to 27. It says, For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. What is the natural use? What is actually here against nature? Hmm, I wonder. Then Romans 1, 27. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burning their lust one toward another. Now, obviously, the natural use is alluding to the reproductive process. Why, the, why is the Bible here condemning men being with men and women being with women in sexual relations? It's not natural. Why is it not natural? It's not natural because the functions of the human body, the natural function of the human body, is in such a way that the man plants the seed into the woman and the woman, inside the womb of the woman, conception takes place and she bears a child. So because of those reproductive processes that is shown in nature, we see a clear difference, a clear difference between the man and the woman. 
Here's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, 14. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. Paul is discussing uh, differences in between what men and women should do during worship. And he says in 1 Corinthians 11, 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Verse 15, But if a woman have uh, long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Now, I'm not putting that, I'm not stating that scripture to talk about uh, the length of man and woman here. I'm saying the scripture for you to understand that the scripture promotes what nature itself shows. Nature itself shows there's a difference between man and woman. And that's what Paul is pointing out here. Also, we see that there is a clear binary in the Bible between man and woman. There's a, there's a clear uh, difference between man and woman in the Bible is not on a spectrum because there's numer numerous instructions given throughout the Bible to women that are separate from men. Many. Um, Paul was instructing Timothy how women should be treated versus men in 1 Timothy 5 1. He said to treat the elder men as fathers, the younger men as brothers, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters. It's so clear. Paul is given specific ways how men should be treated, women should be treated. And this is my point. There's a perspective, there's a worldview already in the scriptures. He gives different instructions to the women that were, were that were deaconesses in, in Titus chapter 2, 1 to 5. He talks about the different role of women in worship in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 11. He gave different instructions on women dressing in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10. So we see if the Bible has specific instructions for men and for women that are separate, this again shows it is not a spectrum. It's a binary. It's a difference between the two. Here it is again. In the creation story, after man sinned, after uh, Eve um, listened to the serpent and ate up that fruit and uh, Adam listened to his wife and, and they had sinned, God had a different judgment for the man that was different from the woman. He said in Genesis 3, 16, 17, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, that's the man, he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Now, the differences in the creation story and in the judgment of the man is due to sexual reproduction. <laughs> the woman bears children. <laughs> the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.15 that a woman is 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 saved through childbearing. And right here in this scripture, why does the woman get a separate judgment? Because it's because she bears children. It's because of the reproductive process, which a man cannot bear children. And in the earlier, when we talked about in, in the trending news with Dave Chappelle, that's what he was pointing out, that women are the ones that bear children. And so that's why the lady had a specific judgment upon her related to childbearing. He could not, God could not give that same judgment to the man because the man cannot bring forth children. Again, a clear binary. All right, now let's go into the next lie. So again, the second lie that I mentioned was the idea that the Bible, when the Bible says male and female, it was not meant to be binary, but meant to be a spectrum. And the main points in that is that uh, first of all, the the Bible, the creation story emphasizes the difference between men and women. There are different instructions given to men and women in the scriptures. Uh, and the, the Bible emphasizes natural differences between men and women. And uh, finally, the judgment upon men and women in, uh, in the creation story upon Adam and Eve, they were different. And one of the differences was due to the reproductive system. All right. Now let's get to the third transgender ideology lie. Here the third one. 
there are no verses in the Bible that is against trans identity. And they say, well, where in the Bible does it say it's a sin to be transgender? Now, you gotta, this is a trap. You got to avoid this trap. You got to avoid this trap by noting that the Bible does not have to specifically mention a thing for it not to be a sin because the sin is already clear from greater truths that's in the Bible. For example, the Bible does not specifically identify pornography, but we know that pornography is a sin because we know lust is a sin. So there's greater truths in the Bible that shows us that transgender is a sin. You don't need a scripture to specifically state transgender. Just, just as how, if the Bible didn't don't specifically mention the molestation of children, we would all agree that it's a sin to molest children. The Bible would have to specifically state it because number one, uh, again, sexual perversion is a sin. Number, number two, the harming of children is a sin. So because of those greater truths in scripture, you don't, you don't need a specific naming of that sin in the Bible. That being said, how do we know that uh, transgender ideology is a lie? Because, well, we just went through the fact and showed that our identity or our physical body is part of our identity. Even in the incarnation, for Jesus to become a man, he had to come in the form of a man. God formed man out of the dust of the earth, formed, fashioned. He created it. The way a man looks, the way a woman looks, was formed by God. And, and the truth of that came down from the Lord himself, in the difference between male and female. That being said, how do we know transgender ideology is sin? Well, we'll tell you one of the sins that it is. It is called lying. Let me say it again. Lie. How do we know it's a lie? Because a lie is something you speak that is not true. If, 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 if we know that our physical identity, our physical body is part of our identity, and God formed the man and formed the woman who had different functions. The woman is the only uh, sex that can reproduce. Then you know if you say the man is a woman and the man cannot reproduce, that then that's a lie. So where is transgender sin in the Bible? It's called lying. That's one of them. John 8, 44. Jesus said, you're of your father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks, he speaks a lie. And, uh, he speaks of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. Now watch this in the lie, John 8, 44. When he speaks it, we're speaking of the devil here. When he speaks it, he speaks a lie. He speaks it of his own. Here's the nature of lying. He speaks it of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. The nature of lying is speaking of your own without an objective truth. When you say, well, I'm, I'm really a man, even though biologically you're a woman, but that's how I feel inside, you're speaking of your own. And the thing of your own that you're speaking is a lie, just like what the devil does. When he speaks it, he speaks it a lie, he speaks it of his own, but he's a liar. You see, truth is objective. It's outside of any one of us. Because truth comes from God. So if you're speaking of your own without that truth, you speak a lie. If it's coming just from inside of you, what you feel inside, you speak a lie. Here's another thing. How is transgender identity a sin? It is called being a false witness. Proverbs 14 verse 5. He that speaketh truth, show it forth righteousness. But a false witness deceit, it has deceit. Now, one of the things going on today is that you have a regular person, they see a transgender man and woman. When they look at that transgender man, and that transgender man or it looks just like a woman, and most people, without knowing the information, are going to address the person as a woman. Same if you see a transgender man and uh, a transgender woman, sorry, and he looks just like a man, you're going to address him as a man. Uh, you're going to use male pronouns. You know, unless in our society today you're told otherwise, but once you look and see, <laughs> you're going to identify as a man. And now you think about it. 
Think about the court of law. If a witness is brought into a court of law to talk about a crime, and he dis the, the person describes what they see, if it's a man, they're going to describe a man. They're going to say, oh, I saw a man running down the street from the home. They are trying to give a true account of what they saw. But the transgender identity, it turns that on top of his head. It pushes people to give a false witness. It says, well, even though I look like a man, I sound like a man, if I feel like I'm a woman inside, you must say I'm a woman. That's a false witness. So now, when that witness goes in the court, what does, what does he or she say? Well, I, I saw somebody that looked like a man, but he was really a woman because he told me that's what he felt inside. How does that help the crime? It does not. To, to really help the crime, they would have to give a description of male physical features. So it's been a false witness. So where is transgender sin in the Bible? It's a lie. It's a false witness. It goes even further than that. It calls others to join in the lie. Romans 1.32 said this, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of debt, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So not, not only does the transgender ideology uh, declare this lie themselves, they, they, they are pushing others to also join in the lie. And they are bringing deception upon others. And so these, is this the response to the, this transgender ideology uh, that is taking place. And one thing I should add here in terms of where is that sin in the Bible is also a dishonor of the body. When the, when the Bible uh, tells us that we should glorify God in our body, which belongs to him, the Bible says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20, we dishonor our body when we do not take into account the identity that is showing us in terms of our sexual identity. We cannot deny the sexual identity of our body and claim a different identity. Because as I said, in the Bible, God places our physical bodies as a part of who we are. And one of the greatest examples of that is that Jesus could not have been identified as a man unless he came in the form of a man. Uh, and when God made man, he formed man out of the dust of the earth. And then he formed the woman separately. And the formation of the man and woman had different physical characteristics, which made them a man or a woman. What you feel inside does not change that reality. If you speak of yourself, what you feel of yourself, you speak it a lie. Just like how the devil lies, John 8, 44. He speak it of his own. He's a liar. And he was lying from the very beginning. So my encouragement uh, to anyone that is holding on to a transgender ideology is to accept what God has made you. And to those of you who are Christians listening to me, uh, these are scriptures and these are points that you can use to talk to those who are holding on to this transgender ideology. You do it with a heart of love. Uh, you do it with gracefulness, but you in no way compromise what the scriptures actually teach and what the scriptures actually say. Praise God. And that is our biblical insights for today. Praise God in how to respond to the transgender ideology. And I gave you the scriptures and I gave you those points that you can make. And if you have further questions on this, feel free to send an email at hello at revivalarrows.com. Also, a reminder, you could check out our website, uh, revivalarrows.com, to get more information on several topics that will help you uh, to be an arrow in God's revival. I'll go ahead and check it out. And I thank God for each one of you again that have joined and listened to this program of Arrows of Revival. Uh, this week, we won't have a Revival Highlights. We'll get back to another uh, Revival hi Highlights in our next episode. Um, but God bless you and see you again next time on the next episode of Arrows of Revival. Praise God.
Thank you for listening to Arrows of Revival. To hear other episodes, go to RevivalArrows.com. Again, our website is RevivalArrows.com. To contact us, email hello at RevivalArrows.com. Send us an email to hello at RevivalArrows.com. And remember, let God shape you and polish you as an arrow for his revival.